So I really appreciate speaking with groups like yours because I have a great appreciation of the outdoors and I have since I was um, really small. I grew up gardening with my father. He's a master gardener. My husband comes from a multi-generational farming family and our older daughter, who's three, um, who you might hear at some point in the background, um, also really just enjoys getting dirty um, and, and getting out in the garden. And the other thing I really appreciate is that when I go by and I look at the Wild Ones restorations and the, the um, pollinator gardens and stuff like that, my first thought is always, oh, I wonder what kind of insects are living there. Um, and I really appreciate the work that you all do because I know it brings, it helps bring diversity for the insects that I study into urban areas. So, I use plants a lot in my research, but it's usually to rear insects, which is not what most people think about when they grow plants. They usually don't grow plants for insect food, um, but that is um, my big connection with plants is that insects use them as a substrate for communication. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And then do you guys see the presenter mode or just the slides? Presenter mode. How's that? Uh, now it's just the slide. Perfect. Um, so I titled this talk, Good Vibrations. Um, I'm also grew up listening to the Beach Boys, so I appreciate um, the play on words. Um, the little known world of insect vibrational communication. So I just wanna start out with acknowledgements. I have a lot of students who have contributed to photos and recordings and some of the stories that I'm gonna share with you um, today. So just to give you a quick guide of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to discuss what is sound. We're going to talk about vibrational communication, studying vibrational communication. We're going to have uh, partway through a little game that we're going to play, a challenge. And then I'm going to share a couple of stories with you about the type of research um, that I do and the findings that, that my lab has discovered. So if you Google sound, you come up with a wide variety of definitions, and this is a wordle that I made from those definitions. So the biggest thing here is waves, propagate, medium. Um, oftentimes sound propagates through solids, but they're um, considered vibrations. And the basic definition of sound is vibrations that travel through air or other media. And if you look at um, an illustration of this, in the air you have air particles that get compressed and that's how air travels, that's how sound travels through the air. But not all sound travels this way. It is energy and it's waves of multiple types that travel through any type of media. So it can travel through bending waves, what are called love waves. Um, there are a bunch of different waveforms that sound can take. So essentially sound is energy and we usually think of this as traveling through the air. So hi, how are you? That's what we usually think of as sound, but there's a huge world of sound that travels through different substrata that is outside of this airborne world. So if you think about whale sounds, uh, whales produce a wide variety of really beautiful song. It travels through water. You also have sound that travels through the ground. So elephants produce these really um, low frequency sounds that help alert other elephants that there's a predator nearby. They actually pick this sound up through these specialized mechanosensors in their feet. And those sounds can travel a really uh, long distance kilometers. You also have sound that travels on the surface of water as surface waves.
you have sound. That's how spiders detect insects in their webs. There is sound that, that vibrates the web that the spider is alerted to the presence of an insect. And then the type of sound that I study in my lab is substrate borne sound that travels through plant stems and leaf litter and other solid media. So as you can see, vibrations are everywhere and that means that sound is everywhere. I'm gonna focus on vibrational communication for this talk. Um, and that's because it turns out that a huge number of species actually use vibrational communication as the primary form of communicating with sound. So here we have two tree hoppers on a plant and oftentimes they'll be singing to one another. And what this looks like in graphical form is one insect makes a call, it travels through the plant stem and it's picked up by the other insect and that insect can vibrate the stem back. So it's sort of like two tin cans and a string if you think about putting your ear up against the tin can and that's the insect's legs and the string is the plant stem. It turns out that over 90% of insects that produce sound are actually producing substrate borne sound. So if you go outside in the summer and you hear katydids and crickets and cicadas, that actually represents less than 10% of the songs that insects are singing to one another. And it turns out that there are really wide range of organisms in the animal kingdom that use substrate borne vibrations to communicate. So I mentioned elephants, a lot of subterranean rodents use thumping and other um, subterranean sound. You actually have frogs that slam their pouch into the side of riverbanks and that produces a sound that travels through the banks. You have, um, recently there was a study that came out, these are stink bugs. They have synchronized hatching that is synchronized through vibrations that the nymphs put out as they start hatching. Spiders create vibrations and even birds do. So here's a, um, just an example of, I don't have sound with this, but normally these tree frogs wouldn't be able to see each other. Oh, I guess I do have sound, but it's not of the, so they're vibrating to one another, that's going to travel through the plant stem and the other frog is going to be able to pick it up. So why has vibrational communication become so prevalent in the animal kingdom? It used to be that we thought that this was a private channel of communication, that these insects could talk to one another without predators overhearing them. It turns out that most of the predators, so you have stink bugs and spiders and wasps, all those predators can detect vibrations as well. So it's definitely not a private channel, which is what people had originally thought um, 50 years ago. So in my research, I study the use of substrate, substrate borne vibrations in communication, and I study reasons for why it, um, why we have such a diversity of signals. And I mostly do it with tree hoppers. So when I originally had the title, Good Vibrations, The Secret World of Insect Vibrational Communication, I'm gonna modify, it's a not so secret world because pretty much most organisms are gonna be able to detect it. So why do they use it? If you think about how evolution occurs, evolution causes, there are changes that occur over many, many generations, and it's based on what's already in place in an organism. So most organisms use mechanosensation, which is needed to de detect vibrations for things like understanding what is down and what is up, for balance, for the detection of nearby prey. So mechanosensation is something that pretty much every single organism on the tree of life is able to use to sense their environment. And it's much easier to modify this mechanosensation um, organs than it is to evolve a brand new organ like our ears completely de novo. And so it makes sense that a lot of organisms have actually tapped into this vibratory channel to communicate. But there are a lot of constraints to it. So um, insects are tiny. If you have a really tiny insect, singing through the air is going to take a lot of energy. It's not going to go as far. 
singing through a plant, if you sing on one end of a plant, that song is going to travel as vibrations throughout the entire plant. And so there are also some kind of ease of communication also is a reason why it's so prevalent. So just to kind of compare airborne versus vibrational communication and airborne, if you're tiny, it's hard to be loud over long distances. In vibrational communication, you can be heard by basically all others on the same plant. You can even have vibrations that travel through root systems onto neighboring plants. For airborne, the pitch of the song that you produce is limited by size. So in order to produce a really low pitch sound, you have to be very large. For vibrational communication, pitch is not limited by size. And I have a video of um, a psyllid that is a tobacco plant pest, and it's super, super tiny, and you're going to hear it sounds kind of like a roaring line, a really low frequency call. So you, normally an insect that tiny is not going to be able to produce a really low frequency sound if they're using airborne signaling. Uh, airborne is often produced in insects by scraping mechanisms. So if you think about cicadas and crickets, they have kind of broadband, um, simple songs, vibrational communication. The signals are produced by a variety of production mechanisms that I'm going to discuss in a little while. So oftentimes airborne sounds are not pure tone. In other words, if you have a singer who can sing a single note, um, that's not what you're gonna find for airborne signalers in insects. It's gonna be kind of um, harsh and um, comprised of a bunch of different tones. In vibrational communication, you have a variety of acoustic elements and you oftentimes have pure tones in those songs. So that's your cricket. Um, that's an airborne sound. It's kind of harsh with the, um, the vibrational sounds you're going to hear. They're much more beautiful and complex. So the type of uh, production mechanisms that insects use to make vibrational sound variety varies from percussion, which is exactly what it sounds like, banging on substrates, tremulation, which is muscle vibrations, timbal mechanisms, which amplify the sound, and stridulation, which is rubbing different body parts together. So I'm going to show you some examples of these. So here we have an example of percussion. I'm going to show you a video of termites, and you're going to be able to hear, you're actually, it's going to be so loud that you're going to be able to hear it audibly through the air, but they're basically pounding on the leaves. So that's just pretty incredible that that that's the substrate borne sound is so loud that it's actually becoming airborne. Here's another example of a percussive sound. This is a weevil. You're going to see it bang its head on the ground. You also have tremulation, and I'm hoping that this sound will pick up, but this is a, a wolf spider that's um, pretty common actually in Ohio down through Florida. And then there's some percussion there too. But it's going and that's um, the tremulation. <clears throat> you have timbal mechanisms. So these are very common in tree hoppers, which are my insect of preference. So you can see the abdomen is moving while the sound's being produced. And then stridulation, which it's like running a comb against a, a file. And in this uh, wolf spider, this is Schizocosis stridulans, noted for their stridulation. They have stridulatory um, 
organs in between their pedipalps, which are sensory organs that, and they also help manipulate food and um, the, the next segment there. Here's another example of stridulation. This is a water bug and they actually stridulate with their genitalia. And then a lot of insects and spiders use a combination of a bunch of these different mechanisms. So here is a um, jumping spider and you're gonna see a wide variety of mechanisms. So unfortunately for this male, this is actually a dead female that he's about to mount, um, but um, you know, he did sing his little heart out. And I actually, the, the person who took this video, I know it's dead because uh, this is a, a friend of mine. So how do we actually study this vibrational communication? So we can't hear it with our ears unless it's super, super loud. What, we, what you can do is you can use a laser vibrometer, which shines a beam onto a plant. That beam is reflected back into the vibrometer and it measures how much that beam is shifted by the plant's movement. So you, if you think about uh, an ambulance that's driving away from you, you can actually hear the shift in the pitch and it uses a very similar mechanism that we use in our brains to figure out which direction and at what speed an ambulance is going, that's um, the same type of mechanism that the laser uses to detect these sounds. So these are originally produced for um, mechanical purposes, industrial purposes, and then there are several people now in the United States and elsewhere in the world that use these to study insect vibrational communication. So, what I, one of my favorite parts about this is when I just get to go out in the field and listen. And this is actually, here's myself, and then this is a sound artist, Stephen Vitiello. He has an extremely large no body of knowledge surrounding sound recordings. He also has a really good ear for kind of magical sounds and how to bring this to people. And so we've actually collaborated on some art installations composed entirely of vibrational signals of these insects. So when we're in the field, we can use the, the laser. Here's an example of a sound um, picked up from, oops, from leaf litter. I can hear you guys. Oh. Go ahead. That's an example of how sensitive this is. So plants are also really good at picking up sound from the air. And so that was one of my students whispering right next to um, the leaf litter where the laser was. Um, we also use accelerometers. This is another industrial tool that we can use to record tiny insects. You can also adopt, um, this is a record needle and use phonograph needles. Uh, one way we actually just go out and scout, which is a really easy way to listen, especially for people who don't have um, fancy equipment, you can buy a mini amp and a guitar clip and go out and just clip that guitar clip onto various plants and listen in. So here's just kind of another example. Those are actually in walking on a plant. So you can tell a lot of this equipment is really, really sensitive. And it turns out insects are using these vibrations for pretty much everything. They can use it as warning calls. So this is an ebony bug. It lives on um, this plant here. And it, I actually call it the monkey chicken bug and you'll find out why. So it actually produces a noxious chemical that you can actually smell if you grab them. 
and it's stridulating to let uh, potential predators know that it doesn't taste good. These insects also use it for parenting. So this is a mother tree hopper. They live on white, um, white oak and she hangs out with her offspring until they become mature. And if a predator comes around and tries to get the offspring, um, she will actually start stridulating and start singing just to keep her babies quiet. And um, a colleague of mine, Jen Hamill, found out that these tree hoppers do this if they have a stink bug or other predator around, they'll start singing just to keep the babies quiet so that the predator can't find the babies. So this is what this sounds like. Um, the babies can actually use it. This is a, a different species of tree hopper. The babies can actually do it to alert mom to the fact that there is a predator nearby and you'll see a wave of sound travel through um, the stem. You'll see the babies kind of pick themselves up. And there's mom trying to find out the disturbance. It was probably just someone using a paintbrush, but the moms can actually go. If there's a wasp nearby, they can actually kick the wasp and discourage it from predating her babies. They also use it for communication to find mates. And that's um, one of the main parts of what my lab does. So here are two Enconopa binatata tree hoppers. They're called the two marked tree hopper. So the male goes, ooh, and the female goes, mmm, if she likes him. They also use them for a variety of things that we might not actually know about right away. So here is um, a three-lined hopper that is using it likely to advertise to mates. And when you start seeing its abdomen move, you'll hear um, the insect make the sound. All right, so that's kind of an overview of how they produce sound, what they use the sound for, and some examples of what it sounds like. So it is now the time in the presentation where I am going to challenge you all to guess that sound. So what I suggest you do is, um, I'm trying to find the chat screen here. If you just wanna type in the chat what you think the sound is that I'm gonna play, um, we can see how discerning your ears are and whether you can pick out insects versus other, other sounds. So the question typically is gonna be, is this an insect or something else? So for the first one, is this an insect or one of these ratchet toys? All right, so we have most people thinking that it's an insect and it is, but it, to me, it totally sounds like one of those party toys that you, you spin around. Um, all right, so is this an insect or is it cow in a can? I'll play it one more time. Okay, we have just a couple people voting. It seems like a lot of uncertain folks out there right now. Oh, Paul, uh, no, Jessica is the brave soul to guess maybe it's an insect. And so Debbie's trying to redeem herself. Um, it's actually an insect, 
So the funny thing, there, there's a funny story with this. So we were, I was out in the field with the sound artist and we heard the sound and he actually thought someone was messing with us and playing cow in a can. And he, he refused to use this signal in the art installation that we were working on because he just didn't think anyone would believe that it was an insect. Um, here's actually another cow sounding insect here. <laughs> So they really have these pretty amazing sounds that you would never expect an insect to produce. All right, is this an insect or is it rain? I'll play it one more time. All right, we're split about in half. It's actually uh, ants walking around. Um, here are these ants that are actually attacking the accelerometer. A lot of times tree hoppers actually have ants that tend to them and these ants were really kind of annoyed that we were disrupting the plant on which the tree hoppers that they were tending um, were living. <clears throat> these are ants that are on, this is a, a black locust. All right, is this an insect or my dog? I can play that again. Whoops, back. So it, it's actually a dog. Um, I had mentioned before that plants can pick up airborne sound really well, and that was a car that was driving by and a dog was barking out the window, and we recorded that with an accelerometer from the plant stem. Is this an insect or rain? Uh, so, you know, you guys all think it's an insect because last time I had this comparison, you, it turned out to be an insect, but it's actually rain. That's what rain sounds like landing on plants, which I think is one of the most beautiful sounds um, out there. All right, now here's a question. Now that we've had a little bit of a warm up, what insect is this? And again, these are all vibrations that I've recorded from plants. What do you all think? Oops. Okay, we, we have some uncertainty in the crowds. That's a bee. Um, it's a bee that's come and landed on the flower and then taken off from the plant. You can hear kind of a click at the end with, when it's taking off. It's another example of a bee. And that's probably a buzz pollinator where some bumblebees, when they land on flowers, actually ramp up the frequency of their buzz and that is what um, releases the pollen and pollen self-pollinates the, the flower. So we recorded those from, um, I'm at a loss for words, I know what this is, milkweed, um, <laughs> uh, which have some really beautiful sound qualities to the plants because they're, um, the, the stems are so thick. All right, so I have two different sounds here. One of them is a stink bug and one of them is a Japanese beetle. So I want you guys to guess is the one, is the first one a stink bug or a Japanese beetle? Okay, so that's one of the calls. The second call is that. So who thinks that the one on the left is a stink bug?
we're split 50-50. This makes it fun though. So that's actually a stink bug. And this was a recording that we got at the very end. Um, the stink bugs were at the very end of a stalk of grass and they make this really nice uh, sounding hum and males and females will duet with one another. And then this one is the Japanese beetle during mating. I'll play that for you guys again. It's just this weird like sound and that's vibrations that um, the, the beetle is creating during mating. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the type of work that I do in my lab. And this is also an opportunity for me to play you more sounds because I honestly could listen to these sounds all the time if I could, but I have to do other stuff for my job. So this is always fun for me um, to share them with you. So I work in Encanopa binatata tree hoppers. This is actually a really common insect um, throughout North America. I knew nothing about it until after I'd gotten my PhD, never heard about it, never seen it. And of course, now that I know about them, I see them everywhere. So they're about a half centimeter long. I mentioned before that they have this duetting that occurs where males will call and the females will call back if they like what they hear. So you have the males going, ooh, and the females going, mmm, if they like what they hear. And females choose males based off of how males sing. They duet back and forth. The male actually walks along the plant stems, will sing, he'll listen to for the female responses, and he'll search for her. And in the end, if he finds her, it ends in mating. So it turns out that these, there are several species of Enchinopa binatata that all look the same. And back in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, a researcher, Tom Wood, discovered that in fact, instead of it being a single species that lives on multiple plant species, it's actually each species of the insect lives on a different host plant species. So they live on red bud, they live on black walnut, they live on black locust, they live on um, hop tree and nanny berry, among some other plants. And each species sounds very different from what from one another. So I'm going to play you some calls from these different species. So that's a very high pitched. This is kind of a medium. Oops. And this is a low pitched one. And females can tell which species a male is based on how their song calls. And these guys are everywhere. So I planted, this was a leftover tree. It's a red bud, which I love. I think they're just absolutely beautiful pretty much all year round. And I put it in my front yard because I wanted to see if they would get colonized by local insects. And they did. And here are some of my students who are actually recording from the tree in my yard um, from the Enchinopa binatata. We also study these out in uh, Columbia, Missouri. Here's another student who's recording um, from the from trees in the field. Here's a nice shot of them. This again is a plant from my my front yard. This is actually how I track when it's tree hopper season because I can see when they're laying eggs and I can see when the nymphs hatch and all that kind of stuff. And here's a, a fun photo of we, we were doing a, a study that required us to track individuals and my students painted little party hats on their pernoda. The best way to find them is to actually look in the fall time in August and September for egg masses. So females aggregate on trees. They can actually, they send off pheromones that they can um, detect and females were, will aggregate on a tree and lay all of their egg masses together. And then they cover them with this white waxy coating. And that's the easiest thing to see um, in, in the field is these bright white egg sacs. And here is if you um, dissect off the bark of the tree, you can see each of these ovals is an egg within the tree, the tree stem. And these eggs hatch in May, around May, when the sap starts flowing in the plant. So they're really 
tied into when the sap starts flowing. That's, that's their cue for hatching out. Here's what they look like when they are nymphs. I think they're totally adorable. Um, they look nothing like they do as adults, but they're, they're really cute. So one of the things that we work on is how temperature affects the signaling system of these insects. And one thing I kind of want to show you guys is, you know, if you go outside, you say it's cold or it's hot, you know, say today was 35 degrees where I live. Um, Friday's supposed to be 72. And I don't really think about, you know, if I take a walk around the park, I don't really think about like, oh, it's 24 degrees here and it's 25 degrees here because I don't really feel those differences. But insects experience their world very differently. So if you go out into a field like this, you and I would walk through it and think it feels nice. For insects, it really depends on where they are. So this is a thermal image of that same area. You have, this is in Celsius, you have 20 degrees versus 45 degrees right next to each other. And if you look at plants in the same way, you can see a lot of thermal variation. You see some, even some parts of leaves are hot and some parts of leaves are cold. You can see some branches are warmer than others. And so these insects navigate this world where temperature really changes quite a bit. And these insects are what we call thermal conformers. So their body temperature is the same temperature as the air or the area in which they, that they occupy. So you have one and two insects here that are really conforming to the temperature of the plant. <clears throat> so what my students have done is they've used 3D printed models of tree hoppers and they put them on plants. So these are actually 3D printed models. And then we can use these thermal cameras to image and look at on this plant, how hot are they in these different places? And then if we put live insects on there, what temperatures do those live insects want to occupy? And here kind of what those images look like. So you have these guys all lined up on the stem. There are several insects here. Here's one that's really hot on the leaf. The leaves tend to be hotter than the rest of the plant. And this guy here is really hot and probably just landed on this leaf. So, what we have found is that it changes how the males sing. So males have a much higher pitch uh, song than they do at hotter temperatures than they do at colder temperatures. And this is so striking that uh, I actually worked with Stephen Vitiello to create this art exhibit that started at the St. Louis University Museum of Art, but then we moved it online because we opened it during COVID or right before COVID. And you guys all can visit this, www.toohottosing.com. And we recorded from several different species of insect on lots of different types of plants and put together uh, a composition that shows how temperature actually affects the song of these insects. So I encourage you to, to look at that. So I'm gonna give you an example in the, the insects that I study, what they sound like at different temperatures. So that's a male at about 18 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I'm, I'm going to play you one at about 36 degrees Celsius, which is about um, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> So they sound totally different. And this is true across the board. And in some cases, it means that these insects might have a harder time finding the appropriate mates. And in other times, like with these tree hoppers, the females actually also change the type of song they prefer. And so the temperature doesn't actually disrupt mating. So that's one of the big projects that we have going on in our lab. Um, and really, you know, if you think about these, um, plants, different plant architectures, um, you know, here are two different species of plant. This one is a lot more leafy. This one's a lot um, uh, more 
kind of scraggly. I actually really, so this is nannyberry on the left and this is hop tree on the right. I actually think hop trees are really beautiful and graceful plants, um, but they do look kind of scrawny when they're little. But these might be in the same exact area, but have very different temperatures. And so they're gonna affect the insects very differently. So if you think about some of your bushier plants in your yard are gonna provide more shade for the, the insects and some of them that are um, less bushy might actually be hotter and the insects are gonna be experiencing a very different type of environment. Um, so the other main insect that we study in my lab are these Antilia carinata tree hoppers and their mutualistic ants. So these are Antilia carinata. I think they're the cutest tree hopper that is out there. They're also called the helmeted tree hopper. And then a colleague of mine actually refers them to them as the rhinoceros um, tree hopper, but I think she came up with that name herself. I totally like it. So you can call it the rhinoceros tree hopper if you would like, um, but most people know it as the helmeted tree hopper. These guys are super color polymorphic. So this one has kind of white and this um, dark brown, but color polymorphic means that colors differ among individuals. So you could have an individual that's all white. You could have an individual that's almost entirely black and then everything in between with each of these patches taking on a different color. So uh, Will was a student in my lab who studied these guys. Here he has a potted plant and he's um, taking notes in terms of what the, the, ins the insects are doing. Um, I mentioned that these are ant mutualists. One of the first ways you actually can find them in the field, which is true for a lot of these sap feeding insects, is ants. So anytime, I'm sure a lot of you guys see in your in your gardens, in your yard, if you see ants around, it oftentimes means that, that there's going to be some sort of sap feeding insect, whether that's a tree hopper or um, aphids. So here you have um, kind of, you can see here how even the patterning between these two individuals is different. This individual is very light, this one's dark. They're just really beautiful animals. So here you have a female who's sitting on her eggs. So females actually have extended maternal care, which means that they stay and they take care of their babies beyond just simply laying them in the stem. So the Enchinopa tree hoppers that I study, the females lay them in the stem and they basically die off. These Antilia carinata tree hoppers hang out near their babies and that's actually how they recruit ants to take care of their babies because the mom produces a lot of honeydew that the ants will drink. So their habitat is kind of prairie or just a lot of disturbed habitat. Um, this is Forest Park in St. Louis. Um, they're doing a lot of uh, restoration of prairie. They live in uh, a lot of plants in the Asteraceae family. So coneflower, cupflower, thistle, but they also are in a wide range of different families of plants, which is really kind of unusual for insects to have such a wide diet. Here is a thistle plant. Um, you can often tell that these tree hoppers are there either by the ants or there's oftentimes like kind of a bend in the stem of the leaf. And if you look underneath, what you see is that's where a female has laid her eggs. Um, so here's uh, really, really tiny babies that are just hatching out. They're basically the size of the tip of a pen. Here's an ant that's coming to help tend these. And here's kind of for size how small these babies are when they first come out. Um, they kind of look, just look like frass to me. These guys, as I mentioned, were host plant generals. So they've actually, they actually do really well in disturbed habitats. So if you see um, domesticated sunflower, oftentimes you can find them there. Like I mentioned, we've um, found them on cup, cup plants and coneflower. Um, there's uh, silphium. Um, there's a, a wide range of plants that they live on. They're also social. So here you have a bunch of adults that are all living on the same plant. They're very tolerant of one another and they have social signals. So I'm gonna play um, this video. Oops.
they have these are uh, mating call. <laughs> The ants, um, the ant mutualisms are really cool. Oh, they, they, I guess this is an anti-predator call. So the ants actually keep a lot of the predators away in the greenhouse. If we don't have ants on the plants, the jumping spiders just destroy the insects. <laughs> So the, the um, ants actually can pick up on alarm calls by the insects and vice versa. So if an ant starts stridulating, the babies will actually kind of gather together. Um, and that way, presumably, they're easier to, to defend. And these are the baby's calls. It's just kind of a little growl. So these ant mutualisms are super important. They're really common in plant feeding insects more generally. So I'm sure you guys, um, aphids are probably not our favorite. We can probably all agree they're not our favorite organism, although they do some cool stuff. Um, ants associate with aphids. Um, they associate with, here's a caterpillar and the caterpillar actually exudes um, sugary waste for the, um, the ants to eat. Um, this is an acacia tree that actually produces um, sugary um, stuff for the, the ants to eat and stay on the plant and defend it. Um, here's the honeydew that this aphid is exuding here. And it's basically sugary waste that the, the aphid or the tree hoppers gets rid of. And as I mentioned that these, um, so here's an, whoops, here's an ant that's tending. So you see this insect here is looking up its bottom. The ant's going to come and take the honeydew from it. I mentioned that it helps protect them, so I'm going to show you this really cool video my student got. So if you look closely, don't worry, the insect, I'm sure you guys are all holding your breath, but the insect actually didn't get eaten. It jumped right before the bird came in. So that's actually how I got my student to work on these as he saw a jumping spider eat them in the field. Um, so these ants actually do different things. Um, the different species of ant act differently. So here are little black ants. You can see I'm holding the, um, the leaf. They don't really care that I'm there. They don't they're not very good protectors. You have false honey ants. These guys are really attentive. You have a fly over here that's doing some sort of probably mating dance. Um, you have field ants, which are also very attentive. So you can see this one on a cluster of individuals. There's a little nymph coming up, stay below. And acrobat ants. And acrobat ants do this stridulation that I was talking about. Oh, but I'll show you that in the next video. Acrobats are also very attentive. And they use stridulation. So hopefully at this point I've convinced you that vibrations are everywhere and they're really cool to listen to and the gardens that you put in your own home are going to be great homes for a lot of insects that produce really cool sounds. I want to encourage you if you have, if you want more information, you can visit my um, lab website, fellerfinlab.com. You can also visit this toohottosing.com website for more information. Um, and with that, I will take any questions that people have. Teresa, you're muted if you're trying to talk. Okay. Does anyone have questions? You can pop it in the chat or... I don't see any.
Yeah, Tom. You got to Is that better? Um, I was wondering how much sound pollution would have, what kind of effect they have on insects, like along a road, uh, trains. That's a fantastic question. So it's something that a, a couple of different labs are studying, including mine. And we're actually studying it within the context of spiders and how, how spiders predate on each other. So one of my students is actually recording road noise, playing it back to spiders and their prey, and it disrupts the ability of spiders to capture their prey. Um, so I think road noise and all sorts of different industrial noise, all of that is gonna have a large impact, not just on airborne, insects that rely on airborne cues, but also those that depend on substrate because leaf litter and plants pick up so much of that sound. And if you listen to the leaf litter with a laser, it's really loud. I don't know how they get anything done, to be honest. And even in addition to, you know, human-based noise, rain and wind make it so noisy that I honestly don't know how these insects are really well adapted to, you know, calling when it's quiet. Um, and so, so yeah, I think there's, we're going to find in the next few years, people are going to start demonstrating that there are really large effects on, on insects and arachnids. So Jessica asks, are they born knowing how to make the social sounds or do they learn them? It's kind of a mix of both. So it is an innate um, ability to produce the sounds, but who you are around when you produce them changes um, the type of sound you produce. <laughs> so one of my colleagues has found that who you grow up with changes your song. And, and that is actually another study that I did um, back a number of years ago shows that basically your local neighborhood changes what you sound like. So it's kind of a mix. It's like, you know, birds, um, they have kind of their, their own song, but then they listen to neighbors and they change their song based on what they hear. So I think it's um, maybe not the same exact phenomenon, but it's kind of this combination thing. Uh, Denise asked, how can knowing about specific vibrations help in conservation efforts like butterfly reintroductions? So uh, a lot of caterpillars use substrate-borne um, signals. There's someone in Canada, Jane Yak, who does a lot of work on that. And so um, obviously, you know, we think about the butterflies themselves, but of course you all know that you actually, you know, when you plant your milkweed, it's for the, the caterpillars. <clears throat> so I think if we kind of look into how industrial or road noise impacts um, communication and development and that type of thing, I think we're going to find that there is some disruption going on. And so it might be something where we might have to preserve certain tracts of land that are relatively quiet and not allow, for example, big oil rigs to be put into a specific area. So I think understanding how vibrations affect the communication, the ability to mate, um, the ability to, to develop properly, um, my hope is that it will inform conservation efforts, that people will kind of listen to um, the, the data. The other thing too is that insects are oftentimes what we call sentinels of disturbance. So they're kind of the one of the first things that you can tell something is off in an area is if you don't see as many insects. So you think about, you know, 10 years ago even, you would drive down the road at night in the summer and your windshield would be completely splattered. And now it, it's very rare that I ever clean my windshield. And so you can actually, what, what we're trying to do now is listen to vibrational signals to see if there are certain um, patterns that can alert us to, hey, there's a chemical spill here, or there's some sort of disturbance in the habitat. So I think that's kind of another way is using them as a monitoring device of the environment. Um, so Kay, Kay is actually my grandmother's name and my daughter, my older daughter's middle name is Kay. 
Um, so I really like that name. Have you played back recordings to insects and gotten predictable responses? Yes, so we can play back um, the mating signals and get predictable responses, but we can also play back, for example, ants stridulating and we get predictable responses from um, the, the nymphs. The nymphs will gather together. Um, so they're, they do respond to um, recordings in kind of predictable ways. But a lot of what I do is actually figuring out, well, what does this song even mean? And in order to figure that out, you kind of have to play it back and see what the response is. Uh, Chris asks, do predators mimic prey vibrations? So the best example of this, which is just blows my mind every time I think about it, is what are called Portia jumping spiders. And they specifically go into other spiders' webs and pluck the strings as if they were a courting male of whatever spider web they've invaded. And the females think that it's a courting male, but it's really this predatory jumping spider that then eats the female. So that's one of the coolest things that, that I've um, seen. So those Portia jumping spiders also can mimic um, wind and other kind of environmental sounds to be able to get really close to their prey. Okay, Jen is asking, you said the insect predators can hear the sounds of their prey if they're on the same plant. Does that mean that larger predators like birds or small medium mammals can also hear those sounds? I think it will depend. I think um, the ability for a bird or a small mammal, like let's say a mouse, to actually pay attention to those sounds is probably fairly slim because they are pretty quiet. So you have to be small for it to actually trigger um, the nervous system. Um, is it possible that predators of monarchs are able to hear that an egg has been laid and they eat the eggs or tiny caterpillars before they're able to mature? I would think it would be possible for a predator to hear the eggs hatching. So, you know, if a caterpillar has to eat through the eggshell, I would imagine that would produce a sound that predators could chew into. There are also, um, there's a really cool study out of um, a lab in Slovenia that showed that spiders actually learn that their prey produce certain sounds. So there might be a component of learning there. So spiders, if they grow up around insects that produce certain sounds will actually learn that that is a prey item. Whereas those that have not don't understand that it is. So I think there might be a learning component in there as well. Do windmill vibrations disrupt insect communication? That's a, Denise, we don't know yet. I imagine if they're producing some sort of sound, they might. Um, there's really only a couple of groups working on this at this point, and we're, we're really finding out that vibrations are much more pervasive in the environment than, than we thought. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Is it possible to trap spotted lanternflies? So spotted, spotted lanternflies, there is someone who is working on using their vibrational signals to control populations. Um, I don't know where that work is at this point, but there are also agricultural folks who, so a student who graduated from my lab a few years ago is now um, looking at using these vibrations of psyllid pests of pears to disrupt their mating and reduce um, uh, the pest populations on in orchards. So I think that there are a lot of different ways that we can use knowledge of these vibrations to kind of take an environmentally friendly approaches to um, taking care of pests and invasive species. 